This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 99, Jackson Love, part two. Last week, I told you the story of two-year-old Jackson Love, whose wicked stepmother, Chelsea Maynard, pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter and five child abuse enhancement charges accused of throwing Jackson in the air and letting him fall to the floor out of anger and jealousy that he was born of his father's infidelity. In this episode, you'll hear my conversation with Jackson's mom, Brittany Gonzalez, who did everything she could to save Jackson from his father's abusive household and, in the four and a half years since Jackson's death, has tirelessly sought justice for Jax. This is part two of the tragic story of Jackson Love. On January 31st, 2022, Just a few days after I had this conversation with Brittany, Chelsea Maynard accepted a plea agreement, pleading guilty to voluntary manslaughter and five child abuse enhancement charges. In exchange, when she is sentenced in March, she is expected to receive a sentence of 26 years in prison. Other than that, no housekeeping today. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Jackson's mommy, Brittany Gonzalez. I have a special guest today on the podcast, Brittany Gonzalez, Jackson's mom. And thank you so much for joining me, Brittany. Thank you for having me. And let me just say that thank you so much for being able to share these baby stories and to bring awareness to, you know, such a silent pandemic that's going across, you know, not just our country, but everywhere. Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, I'm more than happy to help in any way I can. I know it's a lot of people don't like to hear these stories because they're hard to hear, but these kids had to go through this and these families, you know, families like yours have to go through this. And if we don't know about it, there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah, I agree. I definitely agree. And then just, you know, and I don't know, it's uncomfortable for some people to talk about, but at the same thing, at the same time, we shouldn't be comfortable with child abuse happening at such an alarming rate. Exactly. It really is scary. You know, four to seven kids every day in the U.S. die from child abuse, which is just crazy to me. Yes. And that's on a daily, right? Yeah. Daily. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. It's just too many. And as much as I love knowing more about these babies and telling their stories, I I wish I I didn't have to. I mean, for example, Jackson just seemed like such a wonderful kid and so deeply loved by everyone in his family that I would much rather not have to tell his story. Yeah. But I'm glad to do it and uh, and help you keep his memory alive and, and help in any way. So From what I saw, you reported twice that there was possible abuse, but I also heard that seven times they received reports within the the months before. Yes. Uh, So there were seven reports. Do you know who reported other times? Um, I'm not too sure of the other times. I know I did twice. Um, I know that um, Willard had mentioned he was getting, uh, Jackson was getting, um, some support supportive systems into at his house because he felt that Jackson had a development delay because Jackson was very withdrawn when he was over there and did not want to talk didn't want to associate um, so he had assumed that Jackson had autism because my oldest daughter is autistic mm-hmm. and so I believe one of the times um, maybe once or twice the teachers that would go out there the speech therapist and the um, special needs teacher would meet with him every day that he was over at his dad's house. I'm pretty sure one of them might have made a report at some point. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. Having mandatory reporters with access to the kids helps a lot in, in situations like that. So as far as in your custody, did you ever see any signs of any kind of delay or? Oh, no, no. He was, (laughs) 
he was um, very vocal. Um, I understood him and he was two years old. And like I said, I have a daughter who is autistic. And by the time she was Jackson's age, she was completely nonverbal. And I also have a nephew is that's also the same age as Jackson. And he has autism too. And he's completely nonverbal as well. So I kind of know as far as looking for the signs for any development of delays, I know Jackson didn't have one. Your girls are just about 13 and 10. Yeah. So um, Carmen just turned 10 this past, uh, she, her birthday was January 13th. So um, she just turned 10 and then Riley, her birthday's coming up in March. Okay. Okay. So they were a little bit older, but how did they take to their baby brother? Um, they loved him because I mean, being the two girls and having a little baby boy around, it was a completely big change, but they loved him so much. And, uh, he was super attached to Carmen and that was like, there were, they have a love hate relationship. They would love each other and then they would fight and love each other <laughs> and they <would> fight because <laughs> they were, they were very close in age. They, all my kids are about three years apart. Yeah. So that sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can imagine it's been tough on them for sure. Oh yeah. It's like, um, I'm going through therapy. My kids are going through it because what happened was traumatic. No, no, no other kid, you know, that goes to their school has been through exactly what my kid's been through with losing their little brother. No, no, it's, it it must feel very isolating in some ways. It is. It it is very isolating. And I'm just like, you know, I always tell like my girls, like, if you need to talk about it, if you want to talk about Jackson, we can talk about all the good times and stuff like that. But as far as like the nitty gritty like for all the stuff that happened to him, I just don't feel comfortable talking to him about it just yet. Right. And you know, my, my 10 year old, she's like, I want to know what happened. I was like, you're too young. I'm going to wait until you're a little bit older. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's hard. Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, their natural curiosity is there, but it would, uh, if we would for sure give them nightmares and things like that. Yes. Now, you had met Willard at work. Yes. When did you know that Jackson was Willard's son? Um, about a year after Jackson was born, just because we wanted to establish paternity. And okay. um, so that's where we found out that Jackson was indeed Willard's, which I had no doubt in my mind it wasn't. And he didn't seem to think that was the case at first. He said something about Jackson's skin was too light. He couldn't be his. Yeah, correct. Yeah, correct. So I am um, African American and I'm Mexican American. And my mom is very light, complex with green eyes. And my dad is dark. Um, so my kiddos are, can come out any shade of the rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, my oldest is darker. My youngest, my youngest daughter, she's a little bit lighter. So it's like, you know, it's like, well, how can you say that's not your kid's face on skin color? And of course, Jackson, his features resembled me more and my, and my son of the family. In his pictures, he's just such a photogenic kid. And that smile was amazing. I miss that smile every day. Yeah, I can imagine. How did Willard react when you did have to tell him that Jackson was his son? Um, He was, I guess he was more like a standoffish to where he was just like, you know, when can we set up visitation and stuff like that? Because what was happening was that he was on child support. So it was money coming out of his paycheck. And he had the idea that maybe, hey, if I start getting visitation and more parenting time with Jackson, maybe my child support would go down lower. So did it end up being 50-50 custody or how did they split that? So it ended up just being because Jackson didn't know him. So what the courts did was it was more of a supervised visits at first where I would supervise him at um, a park in his, mm-hmm. in his city where he lived. And then it went from that to one day, two days maybe, and then to 50-50. Uh, it was three and a half day every like uh, three and a half days. So on the ha- on the half day we would exchange. Okay, was that for going on for months? Oh man, I was going back and forth in court consistently with him. I thought like I was in the courthouse every month because he was trying always trying to amend something. Mm, okay, and so like yeah, yeah, that makes it messy for everybody and must have been very confusing for Jackson since he spent most of his time with you and then all of a sudden here he is with this other guy. Yes, exactly. So it was kind of, it was kind of hectic. He wanted more time with Jackson and I didn't understand because at the time he was unemployed, but I was working. So he tried to make it seem like I was the bad parent that I was working, that I didn't have this time to spend with Jackson. And then I was asking like, why am I getting penalized for working? Right. You know what I mean? Like I, I was like, I didn't understand that. And the mediator at the time agreed with me and said that, no, leave it as 50, 50. 
That's good. And a lot of times family court is just so unfair and, and doesn't look at the whole picture. It's very messy, very messy. It can be ugly. So Willard and Chelsea had five children between them already before Jax yeah. came along? Yes. Okay. So yeah, bringing on a sixth must have been some pressure, I imagine. Not that it's any excuse. Yeah, I, I, I agree. That's a lot of kids. And then they're all, you know, young. Did you know Chelsea at all? I did not. Um, he had brought her at one point. I'd never met her. And I had asked, hey, can, we, can I meet her? I want to know who's going to be around my son. And he was like, I don't think she's ready yet. I don't think she's ready yet. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, whatever. And he kind of just like bombarded me one day when he dropped off Jackson to my house and said, oh, yeah, she's in the car. Here, you go talk to her. I'm like, whoa, 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 I wasn't ready. But she was very uh, cold, not wanting to talk to me. She was very, very mean. <laughs> yeah, sounds like it. So she she held a grudge against you the whole time. Oh, yeah, yeah, she, she did. She ended up admitting, admitting to that later that, you know, she had a deep dislike, hates for me. And of course, that all came out on the wrong person. Exactly. And uh, I said, if she was if she was an adult as a mother, you shouldn't be taking out anything on your children, let alone another person's child. Right, right. No, he was completely innocent and, and had nothing to do with any of it. Yeah. Are you married now? Um, yeah, I'm married to my um, my girls' dad, and we're expecting another little boy. He's due in April. Oh, that's so exciting. It must be mixed feelings on that, though. It's very mixed. You know, I was like, you know, I my I always wanted a son. And so, like, Jackson was, like, my everything. Yeah, of course. And it's just like, you know, it's hard. But I'm going to make sure this one knows that, you know, his guardian angels is his big brother. And, you know, he's always going to be protected. Mm, yeah. I'm glad you keep his memory alive for the kids. You know, they. Yeah. So April, that's not far off. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the right out of the corner. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, and I'm still working. And it's just like, okay, i got to find everything out. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. Oh, my gosh. Oh, well, I'm glad you've got some support. And it seems like your family is super supportive, too. Yes, I have. So I have uh, my mom's side of the family is super, super supportive. Um, I have my dad's side and I have my stepdad's side. Uh, okay. So I have three families. I have three oh, families. that's good. I was wondering where all the different grandmas came in. So Roberta is <laughs> your mom. Yeah, Roberta is my mom. Yeah. No, I know there was Eileen. Eileen is actually my stepbrother's mother, and she's absolutely amazing. I call her my mama bear. Oh, nice. <laughs> of your emergency. Your world can change in the blink of an eye. He walked into the bedroom and you know that she had been murdered. So he's running up and down, screaming, oh my God, someone called 911. There are two men killing a girl. I know my son and he would not go that long without saying anything to anyone. Safety can be an illusion and reality a nightmare. So how do you see a person, a grown person? Unspeakable crimes can penetrate any small town, big family, pretty face, or innocent child. And in the wake of a loved one's murder or disappearance, there is nothing more cruel or desperate as silence. Why won't people talk about it? That's another thing. People don't want to talk about it around here. For the families of the missing and murdered, they gambled with their sanity as they lose hope in closure and settle for justice. That's where the cold case playing cards come in. In each episode of the Dealing Justice podcast, your hosts Jennifer Dubasek and Lori Jennings will spotlight one card from the cold case playing card deck. Hear the victim's story from the friends and family who knew them best. Her mom will never stop fighting until she finds out what happens to her daughter. Learn about the crime and help close the case. Welcome to Season 2. We're not just playing cards. We're dealing justice. So the autopsy report is a, was one of the big delays I saw. There was a whole big thing about that. Oh my gosh, that county is the worst. Um, just the tie up with the medical examiners, you know, um, the pathologists resigned because they were not working in adequate situations. They didn't like what was going on at the because sh- the sheriff coroner's office in that particular county was combined. So they right. were having issues with the sheriff. 
And so they resigned. And then that was smack dab in in the middle of Jackson's autopsy report. And it took almost a whole year to have it be completed. Too long for you to have to wait to learn what happened. And not only that, it's just that um, that delay had caused her bail to be reduced from 1.2 million to 75,000, 750,000, sorry. It started out at 2.35, didn't it? Yeah, it started out at 2.3 and then it went to 1.2 and then it dropped down to that. And I was like, oh, okay. like Wow. And does she have to post the full bail or is it a 10% situation? I'm I'm not too sure, but whatever the case may be, she's still sitting in the county jail as we speak. Good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she doesn't need to be walking around free. Did she, do you think she was abusive to her kids or did she just basically target Jackson? Um, I'm not too mm-hmm. sure. Um, I know there was something said by her children in court um, because they testified and they were on the stand and, um, they had said, they had said some things and that's hard. And I feel for those kids, even though they're not mine, I know she was a horrible human being for what she did to my son, but as a mom, I have compassion and I feel for those kids because they're smack dab in the middle of their parents' mess. So I have, my heart goes out to them. For sure. Especially if they're all pretty little and it must be jarring for them at least. Does Willard still have custody of his other kids? Um, I'm not, too sure of that because I know when um, they had declared Jackson had been brain dead um, I know CPS had withdrew his children due to failure to uh, to protect. Okay, okay. He was never charged or he hasn't been charged? He was never charged and that infuriates me because I feel like if I was reporting all these injuries on my son after I got him back from him and he had no notice like what were you doing the whole time as a parent like you should be observant of those things you must have known something and he wasn't working anyway he he wasn't working now was Chelsea working at the time or were they both unemployed I believe they were both unemployed I mean I think her with the five kids pretty much she would be you know a stay-at-home mom but yeah from what I would know they both weren't working Okay. So yeah, another added pressure there, I'm sure. So you had last had Jackson on July 22nd, was it? I believe so. Yes. What did you guys do that day? What do you best remember about that? So I had, my kiddos were at my mom's house and um, I went to go pick them up and I noticed that Jackson's hair was getting longer. And I told my dad and my dad and my mom live in the same town. And I was like, is there somewhere we can take Jackson to get his hair cut? I said, I think it's time for a, a bigger big boy haircut I want to see what it was like with short hair so we drove around um the town and every barbershop was full and because it was a Saturday and I was like okay so I told my I told them you know what I'm just gonna go back home and find a barbershop there I said I know somewhere in particular I can take him to to get his haircut and then we had took off and then we went to go get his haircut and I have a video of him it was my first Facebook live and he was so happy getting his haircut and um, he was sitting in a little light and queen car <laughs> and um, he was just so happy. And I thought he wasn't going to be able to sit still, you know, because most kiddos, when they're getting the haircut, they're like, hey, what's going on? But uh, he was totally fine. And even the barber was like, he's like the best well-behaved kid I've ever cut hair for. Wow. And we were so happy. So he got a lollipop. He was excited. And like, I was so happy to see his hair short. And I was like, he looks so grown up. You know, he doesn't, he, he, I love his curls, but like, just like something about him with, with the grown up cut. Like, I was like, oh my gosh, he's so gorgeous. Yeah. And then, you know, we got McDonald's, we got him a happy meal. And then we had went back home and I gave him a shower because it was time for him to be exchanged. Mm-hmm. And then, um, <laughs> I remember driving out there and, um, <laughs> he was always, um, he never wanted to go with the other parties. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was usually Chelsea who picked up because Willard at some point didn't want to do it anymore. He didn't really want to see me. I don't, I don't know what the issue was, but she would pick him up. And I remember um, he knew where we were going. He got really upset. (laughs) And then um, uh, I had him off to her. And before I did that, I was like, he he was getting sad. He he, he hugged me a little, a little tighter. (laughs) And I remember I told him, I was like, don't worry, I'll see you. I'll see you soon, okay? And I said, I love you. I love you. And he gave me a kiss. And then I, that was the last time I got to see him. 
I'm so sorry. You know, no one should have to go through this. And he just sounds like the most loving little boy and, and so happy. And knowing that he was unhappy and scared had to be just the worst. Yeah. And it's just, it's hard because, you know, like, I, we miss him both so much. I just, I didn't think that was the last time I was going to see him. And it was, it's, it was hard. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad he got to say I love you. That's so special that that's one of the last things you heard from him. Yeah. And then you, did you just get a phone call? So uh, I was, I literally just, uh, so this happened on a, what, Tuesday? A Tuesday. And uh, I was on my way home from work and uh, I was picking up some things for, at the store that I knew the next day I was going to have Jackson with me. So he liked his particular snacks. He loved bananas. So I had to go pick up more bananas or fresh fruit for him because I knew he was coming home on that Wednesday. And then I got home and I had a missed call from this weird number. I didn't recognize it. So I let it go to voicemail. And it was Willard. And he was so not shocked, not no, like he, he was kind of like monotone. He had left the message saying, Hey, Brittany, it's Willard. Uh, you need to give me a call back. It's in regards to Jackson. Bye. And I was like, What's going on now? Like, what what is he calling to complain about now? And before I could even call him back, he called me. And then he was like, uh, yeah, Jackson, uh, he's unresponsive. And the ambulance is here right now taking him away. And I don't remember what exactly happened in that moment because I just remember I I felt the, uh, like a heap on the floor. I was screaming and crying. My girls were like, oh, what's wrong? What's wrong? And at the time, uh, my boyfriend was just like, Oh my gosh. So he grabbed the phone, figured out where Jackson was going, and we all got in the car and we headed out to the city where Willard's at. <laughs> and it's just I don't I don't remember the car right there or not. I don't remember anything. I just remember as soon as we were close enough and I knew where we were at, I literally got out of the car and ran into the ER to figure out what was going on. So you got to the Stockton hospital and did they know at all yet what was going on? No, they didn't know at all what was going on. As soon as I got there, um, I was like, my son was just brought in by ambulance, I think. I said, his name is Jackson. And um, they told me, to, hey, go ahead, sign in, blah, blah. And I didn't know it at the time, but Chelsea was right behind me. And she was acting weird and I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. She was just like, I'm so sorry, Brittany. And and she tried to like put her hand on me. And I literally screamed at the top of my lungs in the ER. I'm like, don't you effing touch me. Or I was you will be sorry. Do not touch me. I said, nobody touch me. Nobody touch me. Wow. But at that time, one time, I was just infuriated. I was like, how, how can this happen? How is he unresponsive? What happened? Right. And, no explanation. Yeah. So um, I finally was be able to go in the ER and I was able to see him and he was unresponsive. They had him hooked up to a bunch of, bunch of um, machines. Mm -hmm. And um, he pulled his face. He couldn't even recognize his face. His face was so swollen. <laughs> and I noticed that he had all these bruises on him. And I was yelling, I was yelling at the doctors, I was like, why does he have all these bruises on him? I'm like, what's going on? I didn't know what was going on. And they, they didn't tell me anything. Because what they were telling me, Willard and Chelsea, was he fell from a trampoline. <laughs> that was the story. I was like, how big was this trampoline? Was it like a little tiny toddler one where, you know, it's like uh, not even a foot high or. What was it? They weren't really telling me. They said, oh, he fell off a trampoline. He fell off a trampoline. Okay. So they didn't give any details. No. And I probably will not ever get the full story of what exactly happened. I'll never get. Yeah. And how quickly was he airlifted to Oakland? I want to say after like 20 minutes of me being there, they're like, oh, you know, he needs more. He needs more care. He needs to go to Oakland Children's Hospital, which... That's um, from where we were at. That's about an hour away, hour and a half. They found out that he had fractured ribs and, and a brain injury. Yeah. And uh, they were like, no, we need to get him like ASAP to a, a hospital who's a specialty, which the Children's Hospital in Oakland, it's, the, it's reputable. It's really a great hospital. It's a part of UC San Francisco. So, I mean, that's their branch. And so they're really good. And so once I found that out, I was just like, can I ride with him in a helicopter? Can I, you know? And maybe it's a good thing I did it because I guess he coded when he was in the in the in the um, helicopter. Oh wow! Yeah, so I had made sure that my girls were because I had my girls with me at the time. And they didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I had my sister who lives in uh, Elk Grove, which is my Sacramento, had her come out there and meet me. And she's like, please grab the girls, take the girls. And she's like, no, no, we're worried, no worries. And so she met me in Stockton to grab the girls. And as soon as she took them, I took off to Oakland. And so you were there. Did you stay in Oakland for a few days? I was there for a whole week with him. And it just had to be an impossible decision. You know, once they finally said, you know, there's there's no brain activity. How long was that after he got there? How long did they? I guess the brain scan, I guess they did it in a, 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 I guess he he had so much sodium or something, something was imbalanced, right? To where they couldn't do the brain scan fully. So we had to wait at least three or four days. Wow. And he never regained consciousness. No, I prayed every day, there every time, and just hoping, please wake up, please wake up. Oh God, I'm so sorry. That's the most agonizing wait. And so when when they did the brain scan and and it didn't have good results, you had to make just the worst decision. Yeah, I was thinking I was like, if I would hate for another parent to go through what I was going through and having to lose their child so 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 soon. So I had asked, I said, is there any way he could be an organ donor? So that way I know that a part of him will live on regardless if he's here in physical form or not. And so they they did let that happen, although it seems like they weren't going to at first. Oh, yeah. It was a big uh, deal, I guess, with the district attorney's office because they never had a homicide victim be an organ donor. It was like, I guess they didn't understand the process of it. Um, it was going to interfere with the investigation because Jackson's body is literally a crime scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's pretty common, actually. But yeah, I guess if they hadn't ever dealt with it before. But it sounds like the donor network was just amazing. Yeah, I actually am a Donate Life ambassador with them because of the the way they were with me and just always helpful. And, you know, and just like, I just want to make sure that, you know, I can give back to them and just, you know, volunteer my time. And yeah, oh, they're amazing. Awesome. Seems like yeah. Do you you're doing the uh, the yearly walk and run with them and yeah, it's always a big deal. And you know he's our little superhero. You know he donated his heart and his livers. I mean to two little kids who were younger than him. It's incredible. He's a, a hero for sure. Yeah, and he loved superheroes, so that's pretty appropriate. Yeah, he's uh, he was getting into Batman, and he Aww. was everything was Batman, Batman, Batman. <laughs> so I was like, you know, you're better than Batman, buddy. I said, you're amazing. You actually saved lives. Batman's yeah. fictional, <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, I know it must be just so hard, but that's at least one small bright spot that two other kids get to live on. Yeah, I get. I, I try to get updates on them very so often. I I written letters to the families that I haven't heard anything back. And I get it because what do you say to a parent who had to lose their child so your child can live? Sure. So, and, that, and that's fine. I just get, I call uh, Donor Network West and they have a good aftercare program. And I ask them, hey, how are these kiddos doing? And they'll say, oh, they're doing fine. They're thriving. And I'm like, that's what I want to hear. If those kiddos become something in life, it's because my son gave them that start. Wow. Yeah. So you had uh, a memorial service for Jackson and and was he cremated? Yeah. So he's, I have a, a Kiro cabinet full of his, uh, his toys, uh, his, his Jordans, uh, his pictures and his urn is in there as well. And then I have a butterfly necklace because he used to like butterflies. He loved butterflies. Whenever we see him, we go, oh, butterfly, butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I have part of his ashes in a necklace. That way he's always close to my heart and he's always with me. Yeah, exactly. Oh, wow. Yeah, we did a celebration of life where we just kind of like celebrated just him and his entirety of his personality. I mean, even down to the menu, his menu, <laughs> the menu we had, we had pizza, french fries, <laughs> fried rice, because he liked, he liked Chinese food. And it was just like, he liked hot dogs and he had little mini corn dogs. And it was just like, it was very kid friendly. So it didn't feel like, you know, how, how a funeral would feel very very sad and but it was more like celebrating his life what a good way to remember him that's that's so important to me too is not letting the kids be remembered for what happened to them but for who they are yes so he was a big superhero fan yes and then he loved mickey mouse i remember when he was a baby he was just absolutely fascinated with mickey mouse and he would just sit there and just watch it i mean i want to say he was like well not, maybe it's almost a year old, but he sit there and watch it. And he like he be into it, and I was like, oh, so everything was Mickey Mouse too. Oh, what else did he like, or who were his favorite people? And 
he loved everybody. Um, he was more drawn to my to my mom, which he called Nana. He loved his Nana. Oh, I remember, wow. you know, if we knew he knew we were going to to Las Badas to to go see her. Mm-hmm. As soon as he knew we were in a certain area where her house was, he go oh, Nana, and Aww. he had to make sure that he was the first out the car <laughs> to go give her a hug because if the girls got in his way, he would push him away. <laughs> he wasn't having it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he he definitely had a they had a good bond, and then of course he was very very close to me. He was he, he was very very close and loving to everybody, everyone in our family. If it was his time and he was snuggled up against me, and the girls tried to come up next to me, he'd be like, "No, go oh, away." That's my mom. <laughs> yeah, go away, I'm my mom. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've seen so many pictures. The two of you just snuggling up in the camera. It's just the cutest thing. You can just see the love. It's amazing. Yeah. I'm really glad you had that with him. I am just so sorry that you had to go through all of this. Your strength is incredible, especially considering going on over five years and it's still not finished yet. I know everyone's like, have patience. It'll come, have patience. And I was like, well, how much patience do I need? Because I'm getting kind of ready. I'm kind of ready out of patience. It's just, I yeah. feel like the county that it's getting, you know, it's in San Juan King County, which is Stockton. There's been so many delays for this case. Everything that can go wrong with a court case or anything as far as criminal proceedings go, it went wrong in this case. From the autopsy yeah. report to changing the district attorneys. And then just recently, the judge that was presiding over a case got arrested for a DUI. I saw that. That's terrible. Yeah. I was like, what, are, what, what is going on? So we have an upcoming court date on the 31st of this upcoming Monday. Mm-hmm. Um, we were supposed to see if a, there was a plea deal on the table and it was for 26, 29 years. Mm. And um, she was going to decide if she wanted that or if she wants to take her chances at trial. Okay, so that's what this hearing is about. It was supposed to be about that, but I'm not too sure now that the you know the judge got arrested for a DUI, his docket got cleared, so now it's with another judge. Okay, so yeah, he has to kind of learn the whole thing all over again. Yeah. And how do you feel about that deal? Uh, I feel so like I'm not surprised anymore. I, I said like any every delay hiccup, it went wrong in this case. So I just like I'm not surprised at this point, but at the same time, I'm just kind of like. I'm kind of fed up. I'm just like, you know, the longer she sits in county jail, she gets time served. And it's just like her sentence is not going to be the 26, 29 years, which I think is, it's not enough. You took away a whole life. My son could have lived to be 105, 110. Right. And, you know, I feel like you should, you know, you should be held accountable. Your life should be over too at the same time. I mean, the abuse leading up to her confession of throwing him, it seems like... That has to be in some way premeditation. She certainly did not mean to hurt him. And I know because I had gotten his autopsy report. Um, one of the news stations out here was covering Jackson's story. And the and the woman who's covering her, the um, reporter, she's still covering Jackson's story to this day. Um, she actually gave me a copy of the autopsy report. And I know people were like, don't read it. Don't read it. I read it because I want to know exactly what happened. And I found out that there was ethylene glycol in his system. And at the time, I didn't know what it was. I Googled it and it's antifreeze. So he had antifreeze in the system. So to say that it wasn't premeditated or anything else, then yeah, it's right there. Did they say, or have you heard any reason why that might have been in there? I haven't heard nothing. I mean, I don't think they, I know, I know, was, I always discretioned it upon reading it. District attorney at the time said, I don't think you should read it. I was yeah. like, mm, I'm going to read it. So you deserve (laughs) to know. You might not even know about that detail if you didn't. So, wow, that's unsettling. It is. And I was like, why would you give a kid out of freeze? What what would be the excuse for her at that point? Because, you know, we went from a trampoline accident to her throwing him, which I don't think is the case either. I feel like it was a lot more done than what she's saying. And of course, she's not going to fully admit to what happened to him. Yeah, it does seem like you may never learn the full story. Just who knows what she's saying, how much of it is true, how much of it is embellished or, you know, and it, and it sucks because I remember I part of the thing was he was fine. That was, their story was that he was fine. Uh, they gave him a bath and they laid him down to go to sleep and he wasn't up after, I want to say, three or four hours. And that's when they finally went to go check on him. And they noticed that he was unresponsive at that point. And I was just like, what really happened during that four hours? 
And that breaks my heart if he was just laying there and just in pain and I wasn't there to, I wasn't there to stop him or to help him or nothing. That kills me every single day to think that he suffered so much. And, you know, like I said, I won't get the full story. It's a monster. She's a monster. Yeah. So that's what I, re- that's why I refer to her as a step monster because she's not a mother. She's not a step mother. She's a step monster. Absolutely. She didn't fulfill her most basic duty. And even if he wasn't her son, he had, she had the duty to care for him. Exactly. It said if, it, if the roles were reversed, I would never, ever put a head on her child. I'm going to respect the mother. I'm going to respect the child. That's, I guess it's not, it's not common sense because she didn't obviously have it, but it's just. It is instinct for most of us, but some people just don't, you know, I wish I had answers for how this happens. I get asked that all the time. Who could ever do something like this? You don't know. Yeah. That's the hard part. You don't know who can be capable of things like this until they do. Exactly. And it just, and it hurts me too that, you know, his dad is just like, I I wouldn't call him a dad either. I mean, the whole time he was just like, how do you not know what was wrong with your son? Like you were supposed to look after him. That was your son too. Like, what were you doing when all these instances where he was, you know, bruised or hurt or, you know, busted lit? It was like, oh, my kids must have been rough with him. You know, kids will be kids. These weren't like rough and tumble boy falling off of couch type of bruises. These were like, something happened to you. And he didn't understand that. And I just feel like he, he, he knows more than he is letting on. And he just got extremely lucky that he wasn't prosecuted, which yeah. baffles me. It baffles me why they wouldn't go after him and her. And that was part of the problem with CPS in the, in the first place, right? They didn't know which of them inflicted the injuries. So, Correct. So what was being said is like, I got to the point where I was taking pictures of everything. Like when I get my son back, when I would take him to his dad's and when I would take him and I, when I would get him back. Just to show pictures, like, this is how I dropped them off and this is how I'm getting them back. It, and it was, you know, horrible because he was over here saying, oh, it was her the whole time. It's her, it's her. And I'm over here saying it's him. So CPS at that point was just like, we don't know who's doing it. They said that abuse was substantiated, at which point I wish I would have rather deal with him being in foster care and me fighting my ass off to get him back mm-hmm. than, than to deal with the circumstances I'm dealing with right now. Of course. It's just baffling to me. If if the abuse was substantiated and it was in that household, how in the world could they just drop him back in there as if it was nothing? Exactly. Or, you know, like if, if they didn't know, if they couldn't figure out who's what happened, at which point, I mean, I would have rather him be removed from the home, if, from both of our homes, so they can figure out, okay, where does exactly happen? And, you know, it, it's it's sad because, you know, um, one of the teachers that went out to his went out to the house to work with Jackson every day. Um, she was really close to him. She ended up going out to the hospital when we were in Oakland, and um, she was just baffled because she didn't think that this was going to happen. And I think she was one of the ones that made a report about him possibly being abused at that household, and uh, she didn't believe it. It was you know happening to him. And uh, I showed her a video. I said, "You want to know how Jackson was with me?" Because from what I was getting from Willard was that he was uh, very withdrawn, didn't want to talk, didn't want to socialize. He would isolate himself and he would just sleep. And I was like, that's not the kid I have. So I showed her a video. I showed her a video of uh, Jackson. He was singing and dancing to You're Welcome, the Moana (laughs) song with Maui. He loved Maui. So I said, this is how he was with me. And she immediately broke down in tears and was just like, that's not the same child. Oh, wow. Yeah, and either was he was like so that. scared to be there or who knows, she may have been giving him something to keep him docile while he was there. That's what I was thinking too, because um, I know I was reading, like I, I, was, I was reading the side effects of antifreeze and antifreeze does make you sleepy. It does yeah. something to your system that suppress it to where you would be sleepy. Yeah. And he would always, when I would get him back, he'd always be sleepy and very hungry. I would have to have make sure I had my a bunch of snacks for him because where we where we met in the middle between Modesto and Stockton was Antica, about a 25 minute drive. So I just want to make sure he had all the snacks that he could have because he was so hungry all the time. And it ended up coming out later. One of the kiddos, uh, one of their kiddos, had said that they would never feed Jackson. Oh God! And I guess at one point they had got punished for trying to feed him when the he was kids. hungry. Oh, yes, my God. they must have a lot of trauma as well, just from seeing it. 
Yeah, exactly. Like I said, I feel I feel for those kids. Like I said, like they're not mine, and I know they're her kids. But at the same time, I feel for it because they're going through a lot, and they had to live with the fact that you know their mother killed their little brother. Right. Exactly. It's not their fault where they came from either. No. No. Exactly. That's why I said I. I'm very sympathetic. I'm very, I'm an empathic type of person. So that's like, mm-hmm. I feel for those kids. I really do. Even though a lot of people are like, you know, you shouldn't even feel that type of way. They're not your kids. I'm like, yeah, but there's, they're innocent in this whole thing. It's like, they didn't ask for all this to happen or get right. dragged into it. They're going to have long-term trauma for that. And I, my heart goes out to them too. Well, I hope that they are able to overcome it and that your girls are too. I'm glad they're talking to someone that's really helpful for them and for you. Yeah. And then also like we just keep, like I said, we keep this memory alive. We do the donate life walks where uh, we all dress up as superheroes and it kind of trend now because last year was, was it 2020? Was it 2020 or 2021? But it was a superhero theme. I had mentioned, I was like, well, all organ donors are superheroes because they save lives in real life. Yeah. You guys have a team called Jackson's Justice League. Yes. It's family and friends and family, friends, anybody who wants to participate. It's always in September. It's been virtual, though. I think it was last year, it was either you can be there or you can be virtual. Um, but usually the walks are really fun and get exercise and it's just everyone's, you know, there to celebrate his life and his gift of giving. It's awesome. It really is. It's such a great way to keep his name out there, too, you know. Oh, no, he's a he's a big, big staple in this family and everything we, you know, we think about Jackson all the time. And we always try to do everything we can to keep his memory alive. That's awesome. And if there's anything else I can do to help with that, I'm more than happy to. I, like I said, I appreciate everything that you're doing. And I just recently started listening to your podcast and I, do, I downloaded a lot of episodes. And then I also started listening to, um, was it Jacob's Brothers podcast? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yes. He's, he's great. He really is. I mean, from his perspective, especially as a victim's family, he's doing such great work. I'm so proud of him. I'm proud of him too. And like I said, he's strong. And I know it must have been hard as a kid to go through all that, but to turn it around and just try to bring awareness to these types of situations, that takes amazing courage. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you talking to me. And if there's anything else I can do to help, just shoot me a message. I'll be more than happy to do whatever. And then, uh, yeah, I'll keep you updated on the court proceedings and, you know, how everything goes. And that'd be great. Thank you so much to Brittany for taking the time to talk to me and especially for helping us understand what a special little boy Jackson was. He deserves to be remembered, and with a warrior mommy like Brittany, Jackson will definitely never be forgotten. Next week will be my 100th episode, so I'll be covering one of my most requested cases. Whether you've just started listening or you've been here since the beginning, thank you so much for helping me get to this point, and most importantly, thank you for helping me keep these kids' memories alive. That's it for this week. Join me next week for another story. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to bonus content and exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at Suffer the Little Children Pod, and on Twitter and TikTok at STLCPod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. All music for the show is licensed from audiojungle.net. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to sufferthelittlechildren.pod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone.